Hey, this is your favorite German compositor, Sebastian Schütt. Welcome to 2023 and welcome back to Split the Diff. I was recently reading this book here, The Complete Guide to Photorealism, and I have to say it's a fantastic compendium of knowledge related to color, light, camera characteristics, optics and physics, and it, it tells you how the world really works. But most importantly, it also shows us how we can accomplish to mimic it with our digital tools. So I will leave a link in the description if you're interested, because it was mainly this book and then also watching Avatar 2, of course, that um, inspired me to do this following video. So if you're ready, let's go. When looking at underwater footage, you may have noticed that the deeper we dive, the more all the objects and surfaces get more of a bluish tint. This does not only happen in vertical depth, but also horizontally. The more an object is away from you, the more it seems to lose its original color. But conventional compositing methods will not help us to achieve this look. You most likely know the concept of driving a color correction with a depth pass. For this, we usually work with a normalized depth pass Instead of using the actual depth value in meters or whatever your units of choice are, we squeeze the values into a range of 0 to 1. This can be done by dividing every pixel value by the maximum depth value. Of course you can also achieve this with a grade node by picking your black and white values. We can then use it as a mask input for let's say a lift and some color tweaks. The adjustment will be fully applied to everything sitting at the maximum depth, while everything closer to the camera will get treated less. This way, we create a linear blend of our treatment. We are in complete control of our values at maximum depth, but we can't really define or change the values in between the endpoints. Everything between 0 and 1 of our normalized depth pass will sit somewhere on that line. Of course we can apply changes to our depth distribution, maybe by tweaking the gamma. But we can change the actual color values for our specific depths. Looking at the diving example again, we can see that different colors seem to disappear at different levels of depth. So let's take a look at what really happens to colors underwater. Light is not just one simple color. It is composed of a spectrum of colors with different wavelengths. Due to the nature of those wavelengths, they react differently when bouncing around volumes like air or in this case water. Red light is the first to diminish at a short distance due to its characteristics of being a relatively long wavelength. After that, the wavelengths of orange, yellow and green get absorbed by the molecules and particles within the water. Blue, due to its very short wavelength, manages to make its way through for quite a bit longer. So you can already see why the last of an object you can make out on the water is kind of bluish. Now, how can we mimic that behavior and maintain a flexible control over the different colors based on distance? First of all, we can make use of our three color channels, red, green and blue. Then we need to break the linear restriction a normalized mask input gives us. Rather than working with a straight line, we want to define a curve for each of those channels. I'll show you a way of having much more control. The tool that makes this possible is the color lookup node. The node uses a lookup table to change input or source values to output or target values. The horizontal x-axis represents the original incoming values, while the vertical y-axis represents the new value that will come out of the node. So let's say we want to turn our checkerboard value of 0.5 into 0.7. One option is to either control alt click on Windows or control option click on Mac to set a point on the curve and then click into the number to adjust the values. If we do it on the master curve, it will affect all channels, but we are free to tweak only single channels. 
Alternatively, we can simply type in our source and target values and then add our points to the curve. 0.5 before the color lookup node turns into 0.7 at the output. All other values sit on this curve now. We can go in and adjust the tangents of the curve or add more points. So in a lot of cases we use this node to adjust the color by changing black and white levels or the gamma. But we will learn to use it in a completely different way now by using its capability of being a simple lookup table so it can do some calculations for us. It will only be used as a processing unit, but we will not use the actual output of the node. Quick example. Here's a red constant. I shuffled in a checkerboard to use as a depth channel with alternating values of 0 and 5. Let's say I want my red color to be gone at a depth of 5. I can use the color lookup node as a multiplier. At a depth value of 0, I want the color to stay as is, so I will use a multiplier of 1. At a depth value of 5, I want the color to be gone, so I choose a multiplier of 0. Everything in between will behave in a linear way. As you can see, we don't have to stick between values of 0 and 1 with the color lookup node. In the expression node, I multiply the incoming red value for every pixel with my master curve in the color lookup node. The knob is called LUT and I want to use the master curve. Since it is a curve with infinite values, I have to define the input value on the x-axis for which I would like to get the y value as an output. We could type in a number, for example 5, but that means every pixel gets multiplied with whatever y value we have at the x value of 5. We want to do it per pixel though. And instead of locking us in with a number, we keep it dynamical by saying depth z. That way the expression node looks at the individual depth value of every single pixel and receives the corresponding output value. All the pixels with a depth value of 0 get multiplied with 1, while every pixel with a depth value of 5 gets multiplied with 0. With this concept in mind, we can now define color falloffs for our three color channels separately. Based on our color depth chart, I want red to fully lose its color at 5 meters. So I define the curve for the red channel based on that. I did the same here for the green channel with 25 and blue with 35 meters. As done before, I multiply the incoming pixels with the curve value related to their depth value. But for every color channel, I'm using the respective curve. As you can see, this leaves us with mostly blue color values with increasing depth. But we can also use more than three curves to help us with our look. Let's say I also want to introduce some haze based on depth. I could use the master curve to define those values. In my expression node, I assign this curve to a variable first, just to avoid having the actual expression look too complicated. I simply add this variable, meaning that everything at a depth of 0 gets an added value of 0, while everything at a depth of 50 gets an added value of 0.01. Everything in between gets affected in a linear way in this example, but of course we can go in, and add more points and really define this behavior. That's all cool, but with this approach we only really have control over red, green and blue. Looking at the color graphic again, we can see that yellow is supposed to stick around until 15 meters, but we already seem to lose it here around 5 meters. We will look at a more accurate approach in a minute, but I did a little hack in order to fix it for this example. I can use the following formula to extract yellow from my RGB channels. R multiplied by G minus B.
And now I'm basically doing the same thing that I'm doing with RGB. I multiply the yellow color values by its own curve. In this case, I'm using the alpha curve of the color lookup. And this way I make sure that the color dies off at a depth of 15 meters. I have to adjust the main formula so it uses our established formula. But if yellow is detected in the original pixel, it uses the incoming pixel value. And this is not a Boolean operation, meaning it's not simply either or. It is a smooth linear blend. The higher the original yellow value, the more it uses this original incoming pixel data. The smaller the presence of yellow, the more weight has our established expression. This way we can preserve the yellow color. I can establish this with a lerp function, which takes three arguments. A start value, an end value, and a percentage value that will determine the bias with which these two different values will be blended together. We get the percentage value from our yellow calculation, and in this case it will be a value between 0 and 1. 0 being 0% and 1 being 100%. So if my yellow variable has a value of 0.5 after the multiplication, the output value of the lerp function will sit right in the middle of both values. Our established formula for RGB and the original incoming pixel value. I will talk about the lerp function in detail at some point in the future, but let's focus on other things in this video. If we compare the outputs, we can see that it works pretty well. But that's only taking one additional color into account. So let's leave this example behind and bring our approach to a whole new level. I don't want to be restricted to the RGB channels. So in addition to knowing the depth value of every pixel, I also want to know the U. By assigning a curve to the table of the U correct instead of the color lookup node, we can define maximum depth values for every U. The plan is to determine the U of every pixel of our image, find it in the table, determine the maximum depth value for the color to be visible, and compare it to the actual depth value to see where we are at in that range. Then we can remove the color from this pixel the closer its depth position is to the maximum depth value. But how do I find the U values of my image? I really recommend watching my YouTube episode about the U correct node since it includes me going through that topic in depth. U values can be displayed or measured in different formats and ranges. It could be a circle in degrees, in a range between 0 and 1, or as we can see in case of the U correct node, a range between 0 and 6. If we use a color space conversion from RGB to HSL, for example, which is U, saturation and lightness, U values are being mapped into our red channel. The range is set between 0 and 1 though. So either we convert these values with some expressions after the conversion or we convert the RGB values into U values ourselves. And again, please refer to my U correct episode for an explanation of this process. I'll leave a link up here and in the description below that brings you right to the correct timestamp. You can also find the expressions in the blog post of this video on my website splitthediff.com. We can see that after my own conversion, our U values sit in a range of 0 and 6. I shuffle the U values into my RGB channels and also keep the depth channel. So I can use those two tech channels together with my beauty pass in the merge expression node. Let's define some variables. I want to know the maximum depth value of the incoming U. So I need the Y value of our curve for the incoming U or X value. So if we break down the expression for one single pixel, it says gather the Y value from the U correct 9 node that corresponds 
to the X value, which is the incoming pixel from input A and specifically from the red channel. So uppercase A, lowercase r. Then I want to normalize this depth range from 0 to the maximum depth value into a range of 0 and 1. So when our pixel sits at a depth of 0, the expression will output 0. The number will increase in a linear way while the pixel is moving towards its maximum depth, with 1 being the output right at that maximum value. By knowing the formula for normalization, I use the depth channel Z of my B input as the incoming value, our max depth variable as the max value, and 0 as the min value. I've nested the normalization inside a clamp expression here. I clamp the values at 0 and 1. When our actual pixel depth value goes beyond its maximum value, the number doesn't increase that way beyond 1. The reason is that I want to use the output as a mask to desaturate the pixel. I'm not actually desaturating it per se, I'm reducing the lightness of that color value. I'm still working in HSL space here, so the lightness is stored in the blue channel. As you can see, I'm only affecting this channel with the multiply adjustment. So bright areas of our mask, meaning pixels that are close or at their maximum depth, will get their lightness reduced. After that, I'm converting the image back to RGB. And as you can see, our colors disappear according to the depth values we defined. There are different ways of applying an overall depth haze again, as we've seen in the color lookup approach before. I'm using another color lookup node for that, so I'm free to edit the curve for different depth values individually. It could be applied to all the channels, or maybe just the blue channel, since that's the color that would be visible the last. Also, I'm adding a bit of a blue lift to the colors that are starting to fade off reusing the mask we generated with the merge expression. If we compare this with a grade node adjustment based on simply using the depth pass, we can see how our new approach looks more realistic. I quickly added some cheap underwater atmos to it just to have a bit of a background in there for us to see. So let's play the whole thing. Great, let me finish it up with this little bonus tip. As we've learned, we can utilize the curves of a color lookup node not only for RGBA. Nonetheless, we seem to be stuck with those names and it could be a bit misleading if someone else is working with our script. We can use Python to remove and add custom curves with our own naming. Let me store the selected color lookup node into a variable called node first. With node.nob I can access any knob of this node. The one we are looking for is called LUT, an information we can gather by hovering over the knob. But hovering over the curves also only gives us the knob name LUT. Well, the color lookup knob is a class on its own which comes with certain methods we can use. For example, we can delete a curve with the method deal curve, followed by the curve name. And now take a look over here. The master curve is gone. We could do this with any of the curves. Curves can be added by the method add curve, followed by a name of our choice, so maybe let's call it max depth. And there it is. That can help us with a better read on what we are using this curve actually for. 
I hope you enjoyed this little brainstorming session and find your own fun ways to utilize curves, for example, for very controlled depth treatment. My name is Sebastian Schütt and I'll see you soon. Thank you.